Wow, loving our enemies. What a challenging concept. It reminds me of this conversation I had someone uh, with someone at the gym I belonged to a few years ago. We were doing an exercise class, and the instructor, Nick, told us to run a lap. So everyone headed outside. It was, I think it was like September. Another woman, Chris, and I ran out together. And we had just chatted briefly before class and exchanged some basic information like what each of us did for work. So uh, as we ran out the door, we were laughing because we'd accidentally done too many repetitions of the previous exercise. So I joked, damn it, I'm going to be extra fit. And then I thought, oops, I just told this person five minutes ago that I'm a minister and now I'm cursing. <laughs> you know, people are funny about cursing when they know that you're a minister. They always apologize when they swear. They, they seem to imagine any clergy person will be highly offended by hearing such language. And in my case, I had actually used such language. So I tried to explain. Uh, I'm not the uh, pious kind of minister, I said as we <laughs> ran together. I figured, she replied, since you seem to be good with Nick. I was like, oh. She was referring to the fact that our instructor was gay. Oh, yeah, sure, he's great, I said. And then I added, I'm Unitarian Universalist. <laughs> now, you never know what kind of response you're going to get when you drop the name of our denomination, right? And she said, oh, you're the cool ones. <laughs> oh, good, I thought. <laughs> She's heard of us, and she likes us. I said, yeah, we love everybody, all the oppressed peoples. And then I thought, well, I did say everybody. So I added, well, not just the oppressed, but even people with different political views, like Trump supporters. Ooh, but wait, we, we love them? I really try to have integrity with what I say, and I felt like I was digging myself into a hole here. Saying we love even those people felt like something I couldn't like really fully embrace. So I tried again. Well, we try to have compassion and acceptance for everyone. And then we were back in the gym and the conversation was over. But afterward, it kept coming back to me. I thought about what I had said. We try to have compassion and acceptance. I don't know, it sounded a little weak. I had to admit to myself, though, that even though I believe in the ideal of loving everyone, even adversaries, actually feeling compassion for everyone can be very challenging, yeah? And I made a commitment that day to try to do better. When we've been hurt or wronged, or when someone's spewing hatred and saying mean and hurtful things, or when someone we love has been hurt or wronged. Hating our enemy is what feels natural. It seems unavoidable. We see it in action in the world every day. What's happening in Israel, for example. But is hating our enemy inevitable? It's the most knee-jerk reaction, especially when past trauma is involved. But no, it's not inevitable. You know, there are many thousands of peace workers around the world, including Palestinians and Israelis, in areas of conflict, working together. Uh, we don't hear about these people that much. It doesn't make the news very often. But this is important work, and these peace workers in Israel had been making progress in bringing the two sides together. But despite the fact that many of them have lost family members, multiple family members, due to violence from the other side, they don't descend into hatred. As one peace worker has put it, the only revenge for murder is achieving peace. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, there are many who believe that loving our enemies isn't possible, that it's impractical idealism. We know that it is possible. We are just beginning to learn how. And learning to love our enemies is an absolute necessity if our civilization is to survive. In a recent interview, Barack Obama expressed his concerns about our current political divide, saying that if we can't learn to listen to each other, 
then we're not going to get very far. If we believe in democracy, he said, we have to have what he called a, quote, cautious optimism about the goodness of other people. This is pretty close to what Jesus was talking about when he said we should love our enemies. He knew it would be hard for people to hear. He knew it was the opposite of what felt natural and normal. But Jesus was a spiritual teacher who understood that it's love that will carry us forward, not hate. In the sermon on loving your enemies that we heard an excerpt from, King also noted the significance of the fact that Jesus says, love your enemy, and that he doesn't say, like your enemy. <laughs> Jesus, uh, King admitted, there are a lot of people that I find it difficult to like. And that's okay, he added, because love is greater than like. Jesus wasn't talking about romantic love or even friendship. He was talking about agape. That's a, the Greek word, and it means benevolence. Benevolence, meaning wanting good for others, wanting to do good toward others. And yes, it's exactly the opposite of how we normally feel about our enemies. Agape is the love for our fellow human beings. It's the moral attitude that goes along with our Unitarian Universalist belief in the inherent worth and dignity of every person. It's what it means to place love at the center. We don't have to like everybody, and we don't have to like our enemies or our adversaries. The goal, said King, is to have that agape love for the individual who does the evil deed while we hate the evil or hurtful thing that the person does. A so-called enemy or adversary can be anyone we've had a conflict or disagreement with. It can be a former lover or a friend, or employer, it could be a family member, or it could be a group of people, anyone who's harmed us or harmed someone we care about. For King, of course, the enemy was the individuals and organizations that upheld and protected racist laws and institutions, and it was those who held white supremacist attitudes and committed violent acts against people of color. King was inspired and influenced by Mahatma Gandhi, the leader of the freedom movement in India in the early 20th century. Gandhi, after a spiritual awakening, developed a philosophy and policy of nonviolent resistance. He considered violence a clumsy weapon that creates rather than solves problems. It leaves a trail of bitterness and hatred which makes reconciliation nearly impossible. Gandhi believed that every human being had a kernel of inherent worth and decency. Yes, there is evil, Gandhi said, but there are only evil acts, not wholly evil human beings. King learned the strategy of nonviolent resistance. He then beautifully and powerfully combined it with a call to love our enemies. I want to share a paragraph he wrote in an essay. It demonstrates how strong his commitment to this combined practice of nonviolence and love was. It shows us how beautifully he instilled this commitment into thousands of civil rights workers. To our most bitter opponents, we say, we shall match your capacity to inflict suffering by our capacity to endure suffering. We shall meet your physical force with soul force. Do to us what you will, and we shall continue to love you. We cannot, in all good conscience, obey your unjust laws, because non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as is cooperation with good. Throw us in jail, and we shall still love you. Bomb our homes and threaten our children, and we shall still love you. Send your hooded perpetrators of violence into our community at the midnight hour and beat us and leave us half dead, and we shall still love you. But be ye assured that we will wear you down by our capacity to suffer. One day we shall win freedom, but not only for ourselves. We shall so appeal to your heart and conscience that we shall win you in the process, and our victory will be a double victory. 
I always get a little emotional when I read that. It's so powerful. Loving even our enemies, believing in the inherent worth and dignity of all people. This is what we as Unitarian Universalists ostensibly believe. And yet, it's so easy to make moral exceptions. It's so easy to dehumanize. It's so easy to mentally strip a person or a group of all humanity. It's so easy to see them as monsters, as evil, as no good, and to let our rage and our contempt flow. This mental slide into hatred is partly biological. It's how we're wired. We evolved to go into a defense mode when we feel our personal safety or our well-being is threatened. And as hunter-gatherers, we also evolved to protect the other members of our group from competitors. It is a natural, intuitive response. However, in 2024, our modern societies have come a long way from the hunter-gatherer communities of our ancestors. We've got eight billion people on the planet. And we are currently engaged in over 100 armed conflicts around the globe. Violence begets more violence. Hate begets more hate. It's a no-win cycle. Here in the US, we have our own problems with guns and other forms of violence. Fortunately, we're not at the level of armed conflicts, but the increasing polarization between liberals and conservatives is cause for concern. President Obama said in the same interview I referenced earlier, we're too comfortable right now with the idea that the other side are idiots and hateful and can't be reasoned with. To put it simply, what the world needs is more people who can overcome the natural tendency to hate our enemies. People like us, like you and me. Following that conversation with my gym partner that day, I made a commitment to myself. I committed myself to the practice of learning to love my enemies, my adversaries, the people who annoy me, or worse, not liking, but having that agape goodwill toward them, being able to have compassion toward them. It makes me a person of integrity, a person of integrity being someone whose thoughts, attitudes, and actions are congruent with what they say they believe. My integrity is a value that's extremely important to me, and I'm sure yours is to you too, and that's part of the reason you're here. But of course, you know, despite our best intentions, uh, because we're human, uh, we won't practice love for our enemies perfectly. This is very difficult stuff. There's a story of two Tibetan Buddhist monks who were tortured and imprisoned by the Chinese government. And when they were finally released, they began the long journey over the Himalayas to get to uh, Dharamsala in India. After a couple of days, the first monk said to the second one, so have you forgiven your captors yet? And the second monk said, no, I can never forgive them. Ah, said the first monk, then you are still their prisoner. Hating our enemy may feel good in the moment, but the truth is that a commitment to practicing love is ultimately what will bring us a sense of inner peace and equanimity, difficult as it is to let go. Letting go gives us freedom, writes Zen Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh. And freedom is the only condition required for happiness. End quote. If we're still clinging to anything, hatred, anger, resentment, a desire for revenge, we can't be truly happy. So letting go of our anger and hatred and finding ways to feel compassion, that agape love for our adversaries, is more than a moral obligation. It's something we can do for ourselves, for our own well-being. Letting go of our hurt, letting go what was done to us or to someone we love, this releasing gives us freedom and peace. 
It leads us to a deeper relationship with the power of love, love toward others and love toward ourselves. It places love at our center. And as many of you know, uh, as a denomination, we have placed love at our center. All the major religions in their purest form also place love at the center. This tells us that there is deep wisdom here. Meeting hurt with love takes open-heartedness. It means softening, softening the protective hardness that has encased our heart for protection. It takes courage to remove those, those hard bricks of protection. A lot of courage, but it's courage that makes it possible for us to grow and change, to trust in the power of love. We've been talking about changing our own hearts. We haven't addressed actually engaging with our adversary. And uh, whether you do that or not is up to you, of course. But there are times when reaching out in kindness to our adversary could help change our own heart. And it might lead to a true change of their heart as well. There was a cantor of a Jewish congregation in Lincoln, Nebraska. One afternoon, the cantor, Michael Weiser, received a threatening phone call from a man named Larry Trapp. Larry Trapp was the state's grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan. His self-appointed mission was to spread hate throughout the state by making hate phone calls and intimidating people. Trapp continued to harass the cantor every day. Weiser finally decided to retaliate. He got Trapp's number. This was uh, in the 90s before everybody had caller ID. So he got the number, and he began leaving dozens of messages on the other man's answering machine. He asked him to consider what he was doing. He told him that when he gave up hating, a whole world of love would be waiting for him. Well, Trapp, Trapp got tired of listening to these messages, and so one day he answered the phone. Cantor Weiser was ready. He knew that Trapp was disabled and in a wheelchair. He offered to take Trapp to the grocery store. Trapp was flabbergasted. He said, no thanks. But the Cantor continued to call and offer help. He was so lovingly persistent that Trapp finally agreed to have him meet at his house. Weiser reached out, and at the warm touch of the cantor's hand, Trapp broke down in tears. Weiser befriended Trapp. He learned that Trapp had lost his legs as a child because of diabetes, and that he'd endured severe emotional and physical abuse from his father. Gradually, through his friendship with Michael Weiser, Larry Trapp let go of his hateful ways. He found the courage to resign from the KKK, and he made amends to every person he'd ever harassed. He also converted to Judaism and became part of a community that practiced love and not hate. When Trapp's health began to decline, the Weissers took him into their home, and they cared for him until his death three months later. Now that's a commitment to loving our enemies, to placing love at the center of who we are. Most of us will never have an experience this dramatic. But here's the thing. For the sake of the future of human civilization, we need to make that commitment to love. OK, so a commitment is great. But how do we actually grow in our ability to have goodwill toward those we despise? Well, I want to share something with you. Mindful practice is one way. When we pay attention to what's going on here, uh, we may notice there are at least two of us in there, if not more. But we're, <laughs> we're going to focus on the two. Um, one is our ego self. That's the self that tries to protect us from harm, but also it also, also very often it goes way overboard. Among other things, it's where our negative judgments come from. So for example, 
a driver cuts you off in traffic. Your ego says, whoa, what a, mm hmm <laughs> Yeah, a minister really shouldn't curse. <laughs> but it happens. You get mad, you, know, you lean on the horn, and you think terrible things about that other person. And there's another part of us that's sometimes called the fair witness. You, as the fair witness, if you're alert, can be observing all this without judging it. And you could say to your ego self, hmm, I notice you're judging this person pretty harshly, <laughs> probably because they scared you. And then you could add, now remember, the key is you have to talk nicely to this ego. Yeah. And then you could add, uh, remember, you've made driving mistakes before too, and so how about giving this person a break? And hey, who knows what's going on in their life right now? You know, maybe somebody died. We don't know. And your ego self says, huh. <laughs> but you're not angry anymore, and you have just rehumanized that other driver. Now, this is a relatively simple, inconsequential example. But in all cases, when we have a conflict with someone, we have to use our moral imagination. Our imagination is so valuable. We have to use the power of our minds and hearts to find a perspective that restores that person's humanity, even if just a little bit. Whoever they are. Sorry, I wrote that in later. Yes. Whoever they are, <laughs> can we accept that they're flawed and imperfect, just as we are, and that they suffer and feel pain, just as we do? Can we recognize that they want to be safe and happy, just like us? Can we wish them well? The more we can notice our reactions and judgments and understand where they're coming from, the better we'll become at the practice of humanizing our adversaries. This is my personal practice, and I can say that I am making progress. And it's progress, not perfection, because I'm human. As people of faith, committed to spiritual growth and helping create a better world, and a sustainable future, this could be the most important spiritual work we ever do. Humanizing our adversaries and treating everyone with kindness and caring, with agape love at the center of all we say and do. Because, as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, it is love that will save our world and our civilization love even for our enemies. <coughs> May it be so.